Hello there, my name is Pastor Buck Wilford. I'm the pastor here at Brunswick Community Church. We're located right in the Rito's Bakery Plaza at 1930 Pearl Road. We have church at 10 a.m. on Sundays and Bible study at 6.30 p.m. on Thursdays. We also have good Christian education hour at 9 a.m. Sundays if you want to come a little early. We're a church that loves people and we love God. We'd love to connect with you. We'd love to uh, meet you. We'd love to just be a part of your life as well, too. We're focused in on preaching the Bible. I do it verse by verse, expository style. We hold to the five solas. We believe strongly that we're saved only by grace alone, through faith alone, through Christ alone. And it's all to the glory of God alone. And the only thing we hold as infallible and inerrant and strongly adhere to is the scriptures alone. We'd love to see you out here. We'd love to have you come visit. Thank you so much. sermon for today, which is uh, Luke 6, 1 to 11, and on here, I have a picture of an angry preacher, all right? That's supposed to be an angry preacher. I Google pictures of angry preachers, and that's what I, I picked that one out. I thought I could have found one of myself, maybe. <laughs> you know, don't look nice, or somebody else, but it's not good to be an angry preacher, and that's not what the uh, church should be about, it's not what Christianity should be about. I think sometimes maybe young guys and they're bigger may think that that's what I've got to do. I've got to get real angry. And that's what a good preacher really is. We don't have good preachers. We're not angry enough. And that's not the case. Sometimes it is right to be angry. It's good to be angry at sin and it's good to be angry at yourself. But it's not right to be always angry. And I remember, I remember when I was in Florida, there was a, a neighbor of mine. He meant a lot to me. He's a really good fellow. But he went to kind of a crazy church. And I went to the church with him, and while the doctrine was correct, it was good doctrinal biblical preaching, it was just so much anger and hatred as it was put out. And I remember the guy had a really big wooden pulpit. I like my wooden pulpit, but even a bigger wooden pulpit. And he would beat, and it would be so hard you think the wood might break, and the spit would be flying from his mouth, and he'd be turning beet red as he preached, and you'd be like afraid to move an inch, okay? And you, it was like he was beating you into commission, you know, <laughs> beating you to obedience to what he was going to say. And uh, it was something wrong about the fellow. Later, the guy went to prison for some bad stuff, so he wasn't the fellow that everybody thought he was, you know. He was a very bad man, actually, even though he'd bad, been to some of the best biblical schools and had all the degrees and all the right theology. But then I remember, I remember seeing guys like that in... Uh, and it just, it just is something. That guy, you know, he had a saying. I listened to one of the sermons once. He said, when he preaches, it's like, you know how some people pet a cat and the cat's all happy? But most cats don't like to be pet on the belly. They go crazy and scratch you. He goes, when he preaches, it's like to pet the cat on the belly. <laughs> and it was. And it was. And that's not the right way, okay? We got to, we should do, like, we're going to see Jesus today. Jesus, Jesus is, uh, I mean, this is really good picture. This, that's why I brought it up. The Pharisees. They were these angry fellows. They went around just trying to stick fingers, make everybody as miserable as possible, especially on the Sabbath. The Sabbath was like their day to condemn. It was probably the day that the Jews felt underneath that kind of religious rule that they had going on from all these added rules. They probably felt like that's the day they dread. Could you imagine that? Dreading to get to, to the day that you worship the Lord. But that's truly how how it had become in those days. And that's why I put the picture of the angry preacher. And we're going to see how Jesus cuts him through, cuts him down, spits him out, and how he moves on past those kind of guys. And, uh, and it's really kind of beautiful. But here, it says, uh, I wrote here, Jesus has the authority to interpret the divine intention behind Sabbath law. He makes the Sabbath subordinate to him and as something given for the benefit of humans. 
At the heart of Jesus' conflict with the Pharisees and scribes was the Sabbath. This was one of the major arguing points that went down was the Sabbath in, uh, in Jesus' discourse with the Pharisees. And he provoked it too. Jesus stirred that pot. He didn't, he didn't like ignore it. He met confrontation. He met the conflict. He even provoked it, we'll see, and uh, set people straight and set people free. It was really good. So we'll get on here. We'll move into the sermon here. And uh, the first verse, it says, Now it happened that on a Sabbath he was passing through some grain fields, and his disciples were picking and eating the heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. So like getting a snack, you know, as they're walking through the fields. I never, I once got to see, like I mentioned down in Litchfield, I like to do stuff down there. I haven't been there much this year. But the guy that owns that property in Litchfield, he showed me, because there's wheat fields or were before across the street from him, and he showed me what it was like, and it would look like something tasty, you know? It would look like a little a little ball that the, the end of the wheat right there, that if you ate it, it actually tasted a little bit like bread. You know, it had like a, a taste to it right there. I was like, wow, so this is what it really looks like, you know, because I'm, I love country stuff, but I'm not as much country as some folks are country, and this was fascinating to me. So I could see these guys picking these heads off the ends of the wheat and, and having, you know, eating a little bit of food. And this is what Jesus was doing with his folks as they were passing through the field, and it was on the Sabbath, all right? And uh, the Sabbath, there's, there's books. If you want to see the book, I can probably copy, paste, and send it to you. But the book of the Mishnah had all these extra rules that the Jewish people had put into place. Because they didn't feel that the law was enough. They didn't feel like it described it to T enough. They wanted to make things harder, not better. And that's where a lot of these things, there was nothing wrong with what Jesus' guys were doing here on this day. But in that day, in the way that the religious thought, in the way that the, the temple, in the way that the teaching had become, he was like a major violator to them. But he wasn't a major violator of what he said himself in his own word. And this is where it will set him straight. And think about this. You are going to see this was deliberate that Jesus was doing this. If you look back in context, think about the last few weeks when I preached. Jesus, it, the, these Pharisees are constantly coming at him. And Jesus is provoking them. You know, like he says in one of the last sermons I preached, when uh, the man gets taken down through the pallet, from the breaks the ceiling open to bring the, the paralyzed man to him, he asks them, is it easier for me to forgive sins or to heal? And they knew that only God could forgive sins. And he said that specifically for them, I think. So they would know he is God and who has the authority there. And now he's going to call himself the Lord of the Sabbath. I mean, that's like one of the Jehovah names. You know, you talk about all these different names that describe God. One of them is Jehovah of the Sabbath, Lord, Lord Saboeth right there, Jehovah Saboeth. So this is like a, this is a complete him telling them, I am God. When they're coming in thinking he's, he's some false prophet or some crazy man, and they're trying to disprove him, and now he's saying, I am God myself. Let me tell you, this is provocative for these guys, all right? So he says, but some of the Pharisees said, why do you do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? It wasn't lawful because they had made things lawful, uh, unlawful. But here, you can look back in the Bible, the Deuteronomy 23, 25, such snacks were permitted in transit. Okay? I thought that was kind of funny. Right? So, <laughs> sure. Such snacks are permitted in transit, 23, 25. What wasn't permitted for you to pull out a sickle and start chopping down the guy's wheat. That would be thievery. But it was a very beautiful type of community setting where if you had extra, you're supposed to share your extra a little bit, you know. And it wasn't like, uh, think about the book of Ruth, where Ruth is really poor and, uh, and her, her mother-in-law, Naomi, is poor. And she tells her to go out there and glean the fields. And think about Boaz as they fall in love and, and he notices her and he says, leave a little bit extra behind when you glean the field. Like, when you cut down those wheat things, leave it on the ground. Because you were allowed to pick up stuff that was left over. You were allowed to, to glean the leftovers. And that wasn't thievery and it wasn't against the law. And it was actually law that they were to be kind to people to make sure that we kind of take care of other people. You know, And that's where uh, this came in. So they weren't stealing nothing, walking through the fields of grain, taking a few snacks off the top. This was totally lawful. But the Pharisees... They had come to a point, they had come to the point, like I know it, I told you the guy beat this pulpit and yelling of this anger, as if religion is all about anger, following God's all this angry stuff. I tell you, I've heard it before, 
and it was a cliche, but I think it's kind of true. You know, sometimes sarcasm has some truth. It says, a black man, he's got to get happy before he preaches. But a white man, he's got to get angry before he preaches good. And then that's kind of true. You think about it. When you watch some black preachers, they get real happy. And then they get going, and it's really good. And yet, so unfortunately, a lot of us white preachers, we just get real angry. And then, man, we get into the work and we get good. Like, I love Paul Washer. I could think Paul Washer kind of like that, right? But Paul Washer is definitely a man that preaches the word and truth and the beauty. But, but uh, you don't want to always be angry, though. That's, that's not the way it should be. You shouldn't, shouldn't put that upon people and put it a burden. Truly, I have this little last slide. I need to sneak through. My last slide is that one, gentle and lowly. You know, that that's how God's character is. Gentle and lowly. Come to me. You know, all you are heavy laden and burdened. I will give you rest. That's who Christ is. That's what real faith in God is. It's beautiful. And it's so wonderful. Does it mean you're always happy? No. You know, I was feeling pretty happy this morning thinking about things. And then I thought, man, I'm so happy. It's just so good. And then I thought, but sometimes we're not so happy. You think about Christ suffering on the cross. That was not a happy time at all. And there's times in life where we do go through very difficult times in life. But there's other times that, thank God, there are some happy times, all right? And it's okay to be happy. And it's okay to be happy on the Sabbath, the happy of the day that you worship the Lord. That's a good thing. Don't let, don't let me go take you off some crazy route and you think, golly, this guy's some health, wealth, prosperity guy. I'm definitely not that guy. I'm getting angry tangents about that. <laughs> All right, so here, I know this looks boring, but it's such good stuff I want to share with you. All right, uh, the rules about the Sabbath, the festival offerings and sacrilege are as mountains hanging by a hair. Think about a mountain hanging by a hair. You think, golly, that's not much, right? For scripture is scanty and the rules many. All right, this is from the Mishnah. That little M is for the Mishnah on Haggai 1.8. So this was the Jewish commentary response to add to the Word of God. Jews believed they needed a fence around the law, for what the individual did affected the nation as a whole, and they believed it's what brought them under the Roman oppression. We can almost kind of see some correlations and connections today. You know, we talk about how if we'll humble ourselves before the Lord, if we'll repent and believe, God would bless our nation. And that indeed is true, but some people may take that to such an extreme that it's not a healthy extreme, okay? And that's the way that the Jewish leaders did. They took these things to an unhealthy extreme, and they thought there's not enough law describing what to do with the Sabbath. We've got to add to it. We've got to bolster it up. Everybody's got to be just like us in how we view the Sabbath and how we be, and we've got to be the rule ones that put the hammer down, okay? And that's what they're trying to do to Jesus. They're trying to put the hammer down on him. And this wasn't like a couple of rogue Jews. This was the highest people of the day representing the Jewish faith. And this is what they believed. So they were pretty upset. But here, the law permitted one to pass through a neighbor's field and pluck grain as long as one did not attempt to harvest it, put a sickle to it, like I said in that previous verse. Picking grain and rubbing it on the Sabbath could be construed as harvesting, is what they thought. And that is how the Pharisees saw it. Once again, a Mishnah. That's what them's for. Therefore, they declare that the disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. God commanded that the Sabbath be kept holy. How does one keep the Sabbath holy? By not working. This leads to the next question. What qualifies as work? The Pharisees sought to give precise classifications of work to create habits of normalcy that prevented violations of the law. So, I mean, they're trying to do good, you know, and what they felt was good. But they had missed the air. They missed the mark as they tried to do good. And they went into this extremism type of thing that took all of the joy away from the Sabbath. And made it something that God never meant it to be. And Jesus answered and said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him. So he goes to Scripture. And that's beautiful. How do we see Jesus relate? It is Scripture. Scripture with Scripture. What should we be in? Scripture. We should know our Bibles. We should know it in and out. If somebody tells me something about the Bible that I don't know, let me tell you, I'm like, I'm looking it up. I want to know that. I've read the Bible back and forth many times through, and no matter how many times I read it, I always see something that I didn't catch before, something I didn't connect with before. It's a book that's so deep, it doesn't get to the bottom. But they knew Scripture as well. Pharisees did know Scripture good. And Jesus throws this out there. This isn't like a peacemaking thing saying, oh, 
you know, saying something nice and just deflecting and moving on. This is like stand your ground, pick a fight, and throw the first punch is what Jesus did to these guys. He says, he's, he brings up this thing. And what it was is it's from 1 Samuel 21, 1 through 6. All right? And, uh, and it's King David and he's on the run. And when he's on the run, you know what he does is he goes to a, 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 a temple, he goes to a place, and he eats the showbread is what he eats. And that was only meant for priesthood. We'll read that in the next verse. And Jesus cites that as well, too. But uh, I put rabbit trail here. And I know I usually don't go down rabbit trails, but I just want to go down this rabbit trail real quick. <laughs> it's because it's you think about that story. I mean, this is something that Jesus brings up. When Jesus did this, he was running from King Saul, who was trying to kill him because King Saul was jealous and King Saul knew that God had chosen King David to be king over him. And he didn't want to lose his power. He had pride. He had his position. You know, he thought about his son too. He wanted his son Jonathan and them to be king after him. And he knew it was all about to go away. And uh, the demons plagued him too. It said at nighttime, demons came and plagued King Saul. He even tried to shish kebab David a couple times with his spear to the wall when those demons came upon him in the evening. I think two or three times David escaped from him trying to stab him through and through to the wall. But as King, as Saul's chasing David and he goes here when he's hungry to this place to eat, what happens is later King Saul shows up and one of these guys that's in the crowd of all these other priests that are there, Doag the Edomite, he says to him, he says, who did this? What happened here? And Doag spills the beans. Mm -hmm. And then after Doag spills the beans, you know what he tells his men? He says, kill all these priests for helping David. Slaughter them right now. And they all had like a fear of God still, even though they were following King Saul, they wouldn't do it. And what happens then is Doag, this terrible type of fella, kills them all. This guy takes it upon himself to kill them all. So talk about one evil man. There's, I think there's even a psalm. There's a psalm all about Doag the Edomite, if you look in the psalms. But uh, but that's where this story went down towards. So it ended up being pretty bad. David felt bad about everything that had happened right there. And he said, I knew it would be that Doag. So it was like a shady character they looked at before and they, they suspected. So, But that was a rabbit trail. Let me get back on here. So Jesus tells him, he says, have you never read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him. How he entered the house of God and took and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for any to eat except the priest alone, and gave it to his companions. So, so Jesus cites the scripture. He uses scripture with scripture when he's teaching, and it's beautiful. That's how we should interpret everything, with scripture. And this consecrated bread would probably have been about a week old. And you think if we would have week old bread, oh, you may not want to eat it, especially if there wasn't good environment or something. There'd be mold, there'd be white stuff on there, oh, it would be bad. But back there with the kind of bread that they used for these things, it would have been like a cracker. It would have dried up and been like a cracker. So it wouldn't have been uh, it wouldn't have been all nasty like we would think bread would be these days. But this is what happens. And uh, in Leviticus 24, 5 to 9 is where it says that this kind of bread is only meant for the priest alone. And his point is made from the lesser to the greater is what Jesus' point is. If the law could be set aside by David and his men in their urgent situation, how much more so for Jesus and his disciples in a situation of greater urgency? It was a bigger urgency. He's with God. They're with God, walking with God. That's even a bigger deal than King David running from King Saul with his band of men that are protecting him. And, uh, and the necessity of proclaiming the reign of God. That's what the disciples were on, the mission. Why was their mission so important? Because they were sharing about God. They were sharing. They had Jesus with them. And they were sharing the reign of God. And God was right there in their midst. So it's pointing out that this was an urgent situation. And it's pointing out that the law could be set aside for a situation like that with King David. How much more important would it be to be set aside for God himself and his people to be able to eat? Because they weren't priests. These were uh, really, if you look at the disciples... They were just your ragtag fellows right here. They weren't your super highly educated. Most of them weren't. They were fishermen. They were like your regular common people, your common Joes. I like that term, common Joes. I know a real good guy named Joe. He's here today, too. <laughs> so they were like your common Joes. So this is what it was. And uh, Jesus gives them this example. 
And he was saying to them, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. So he just inferred that he was greater than King David, and now he tells them, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. And he already called himself Son of Man earlier, if you read the chapter before. And the Son of Man, they knew, was in the book of Daniel with the Ancient of Days, and they knew the status of the Son of Man. And here Jesus is calling himself once again to these people who hate him for this purpose. He calls himself the Son of Man, and now he calls himself the Lord of the Sabbath, which would be a term only for God alone. Like I say, if you look at all these Hebrew names for gods, you know, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, there's also Jehovah Sabaoth, which means the Lord of the Sabbath. And here Jesus calls himself the Lord of the Sabbath. And I wrote on the top, it's kind of hard to read maybe for you, hard to read for me too, but I had to get it in here. So I'll read. It says, the controversy does not lead to a statement about the humanitarian purpose of the Sabbath. Instead, it results in a pronouncement that Jesus, as the enigmatic Son of Man, is Lord of the Sabbath. The conclusion is that he has the authority to set aside the Sabbath laws to the benefit of his disciples. He can decree what is lawful and unlawful. He, not the Sabbath commandment, like Romans 7, 1, is the Lord who rules over his disciples. Consequently, his disciples need not concern themselves about appearing irreligious or paying any attention to criticism when they are with him and they are carrying out their urgent task for God. The Sabbath conflict becomes an opportunity to make a Christological point. Jesus as Lord can declare what he wants. All right? I mean, this is powerful. This is like him saying, hey, I am the God of the Bible. I am the one who makes the rules here. I am the one that says what's right and what's wrong. That's what Jesus is telling them. Talk about an enormous uh, boom. I mean, think about, like, if you heard, like, a, sometimes we hear a big boom when an electrical thing goes off or something, or a sonic boom from the sky. Imagine that kind of power when Jesus said these words in their presence. What kind of, like, shock and awe, what type of, uh, what type of, uh, of, uh, of uh, upsetness he just did with them when he said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. You know, I can do what I want to do. I make the law. I'm the one that governs what goes on in the Sabbath and what does not go on in the Sabbath. That, that's what he lays out to these guys. This was amazingly powerful and amazingly provoking to these guys that were the Jewish leaders of the day. Now it happened that on another Sabbath, so now we're going from Sabbath to Sabbath, he enters and it keeps hitting that point of the Sabbath Luke brings out again here. And now it happened that on another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And there was a man there whose right hand was withered. Now, whenever you would see a withered hand, like you, there's some cool books you can get and study about. You study about Jewish culture. You study about how they viewed things in those times. And it helps you understand the Bible better today. We should never try to understand the Bible in our own view, in our own times, and forget about the way it was back then. Because we'll just make fake meanings up when we do that. We, we would be like the guys making the mission. We'll add all this hocus-pocus stuff that's not really true. We've got to try to learn how would they have understood it in that day and at that time because that's the exact audience it was written to. It still applies to us as well fully, but then that's where the preacher task has to come. Well, how do we cross that bridge and how do we bring that to understanding today without changing the meaning? So one of the ways when they heard the word withered hand, when they saw this guy with a withered hand, what were they thinking? They're thinking about these verses like Psalm 137, 5, Zechariah 11:17. 1 Kings 13, 4 through 6. 1 Kings is where uh, the king stretches out his hand at the prophet. And what happens? His hand withers when it's stretched out at the prophet because God does not agree with what he's doing. And how dare he do that toward God's person right here. So a withered hand was a sign of punishment by God. I mean, even think about uh, Miriam when she got leprosy and things. So think, about, uh, think about Moses even when... Uh, you know, he's showing to what sign will he show the Pharaoh when he sticks his hand in his jacket and it comes out full of leprosy and he puts it back in and then it comes out fine. A withered hand meant something back then and it usually meant cursed by God. So they're thinking, here's this guy that's cursed by God and it's the Sabbath and Jesus is encountering him on the Sabbath. And this is like the mindset of what they're doing. And they're probably thinking, this guy's some awful sinner and he's punished by God. You know, why would you dare break a rule on the Sabbath for a man like this? This, this is what the mindset is of the people. And Jesus encounters this person who needs liberation 
from the captivity and of his infirmity in, in his sins. All right? Because Jesus knew he was a sinner. The Bible says every single one of us is a sinner. If any of us think we're not a sinner, we've got a long way to go. Okay? We're not there at, at, at base one yet with salvation. If we don't think we're a sinner. You have to know you're a sinner and you need a Savior and you need Jesus who died for your sins and paid the price for your sins. But, but Jesus encounters this guy and he's in trouble. He's got infirmity too. And what do we see? We see kindness. We see love. We see something we wish we would have somebody do to us on a Sabbath day or any day of the week right here. Okay? And the scribes and the Pharisees were watching him closely to see if he heals on the Sabbath so that they might find reason to accuse him. So this is Luke narrating in the background, okay, as he's, as he's telling Theophilus or whoever, I think it's Theophilus, it's what it was, yeah, I think it's Theophilus for Acts and Luke, and he's telling them these details, and these guys are watching. So we see the setting, we see the heavy religious leaders who hate Jesus so much, you just say, Lord, the Sabbath and stuff, and they're watching to see what's he going to do. Is he going to break a rule on the Sabbath? And uh, I wrote on here, the Holy Spirit promised Simon, that's Peter, that he would not see death before he had... That's not Peter, I'm sorry. That's not Peter. That's the that's the, the prophet man that was at the temple, okay? That, with uh, Anna the prophetess. And he, the Holy Spirit promised Simon that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Isaiah proclaimed, all flesh, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. But all the scribes and Pharisees care to see is whether Jesus would heal on the Sabbath. They are only interested in sat saddling him with the charge of Sabbath breaker, an offense worthy of death. If you look at Exodus 31, 14, a fellow gets killed. God hasn't killed the fellow because he's carrying sticks on the Sabbath. In their zeal to protect the law, they do not use it to set captives free, but to bind them even tighter. They have no power to heal, only to deal out death. That's that angry preacher type of stance. There's nothing good coming from that guy, just harder worser things, okay? A good way of angry preacher, maybe, if a guy's angry all the time like that, I would label him as a legalistic preacher. Legalism, okay? Legalism has no life at all, and it's just as bad as liberalism, okay? Legalism and liberalism are both sinful ways to be and terrible, okay? And we've got to be careful. We don't fall. I, I always I say the thing, you heard me say it before, some of you, is I think of Christianity and our life is like a road. And we're supposed to be in the center of the road following Christ. And on the left side of Christianity is a whole bunch of liberal stuff that's super sinful, non-biblical. And on the right side is a whole bunch of legalistic, super strict stuff. And both of them are like gutters. And if you think of a gutter, how are you going to move down a gutter very well? You're not going to move down a gutter very well. And we've got to know ourselves and know which side do we bump into ourselves. Because we all kind of have a tendency to bump one side or bump the other side. And we need to keep going back in the center of the road. And this is what this is what these guys were. These South Pharisees were deep down into the gutter of legalism right there. They, they had made it what they had. They probably made it what they had. They probably taught that from the people that were before them. The Mishnah didn't just come out right in Jesus' time. Okay, this has been something they've been following and practicing. But he knew what they were thinking, and he said to the man with the withered hand, Get up and come forward. And he stood up and came forward. So imagine how happy that guy would have been. Imagine how happy you would be if Jesus said, Get up and come over here. You'd be like, Oh, oh, praise God. I know this is something good, I think, right? And uh, this is what happens to the guy. He comes forward. And uh, I wrote here, Liberating captives is not to be limited only to certain days of the week. The Sabbath can become an occasion to do good rather than simply a time to refrain from work. The criterion is whether or not it helps those who are in need. These Pharisees are interested only in making sure that the law is well defended. And as a result, they barricade themselves and others in a stockade of their own making. They would be satisfied for the man to remain withered. Jesus came to set the withered free. And he figured it would probably make them happy that guy who they may think is cursed by God with the withered hand, if he would just stay just the way that he is. But it wasn't happy for Jesus. It wasn't the right thing for Jesus. The right thing for Jesus was to heal the man. And he calls him forward and he brings him up to be healed. And that's a beautiful thing. Think about it. That's what Jesus is. He's our Savior. Not just our Savior, but the Savior of all those who believe. Okay? And maybe they were kind of, we know for sure they were kind of racist in a way that they didn't think it should be to the Gentiles. They didn't think that it should be to non-Jews. It was like their way and their salvation and nobody else's. 
And Jesus, and all the way through the Old Testament too, points out that it's for the nations, for the nations. And even in the end times, book of Revelation, you know, what's heaven going to be like is going to be full of people from all types of nations and colors and languages and everything are going to be there who follow the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in Him. But here, Jesus calls this guy forward on the Sabbath. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? To save a life or to destroy it? So Jesus asked these Pharisees this, this question. He, he's meeting them theologically. He's meeting them right there. He's meeting them philosophically. He's meeting them right there on the level of the mind and the intellect. And he's taking time to talk to them. That's something that keeps hitting me as we've been going through these last three or four sermons on this, on this passage from 5 to 6. Is how much time Jesus took with these crazies. You know? I tell you, sometimes when I meet some crazies... I don't feel like taking any time at all. I'm like, I'm moving right on out of here. I am not going to waste my time. But we see Jesus take time with these crazies, with these fellas. And he is really loving the way that he took time to try to help them and to guide them the right way. I mean, some of them got saved. Think of Nicodemus. All right? We think Nicodemus got saved. He helped bury Jesus. Think of Paul. Think of Paul. You know, Saul of Tarsus right there. Think of what uh, Paul would have been. I don't know if he was in that crowd right there, but he, this was his type of people right here. You know, he was alive back then, and uh, and yet, so it did help for Jesus to speak to these guys, even though they were such troublemakers. And the Mishnah, they had a clause in the Mishnah, the book that the Jews had made with extra laws. They had a clause, the only healing could happen was of a mortal threat. So if a baby, a woman was having a baby, which back then a lot of women didn't make it through childbearing, okay? There was a lot higher mortality rate than there is today. But... Uh, if a woman was having a baby or someone was about to die, then you could give them medical treatment or help. But other than that, you weren't getting nothing on the Sabbath. Just imagine, your kid gets so deadly ill, sick, and somebody's like, he ain't dying. You're like, I don't know. I'm so worried, right? But back then, they had put a rule like this. This wasn't Jesus' rule. This was the Jews' rule. You know, picture that guy beating on the pulpit, that angry type of guy, that Jewish type of attitude that, you know what? This is the way it's going to be. And that wasn't what Jesus did. Jesus asked him, what's good? Is it good to do harm or is it good to do bad on the Sabbath? You know, what is it do, should you do good or should you do or should you harm? You know, really, you think about that, I, that hits me on a little bit of a rabbit trail, but I won't go long. Is you think about you think about the, the Hippocratic oath of the doctors, right? That they take when they become doctors. First, I shall do no harm. When I became a medic in the army, they had a big board with that right on there. So we would all remember, first, we shall do no harm. And then you think about today, doctors killing babies. Oh my, have they lost the Hippocratic oath with some of them. Or doctors mutilating people's bodies to be something that's not naturally what they should be. Okay? There's some big troubles these days. And that's doing harm. Okay? And Jesus says, is it good to do good? Or is it good to do harm on the Sabbath? Is it good to save life or destroy life? All right? And uh, I wrote on here, this could be a bit controversial to you, but, you know, I, I don't shy away from it. But talk about, there's, there's Sabbatarians of different degrees and sorts these days, okay? And, and some of them, and I respect them too, and I love them, I love them too. But, uh, but some of them will say that it's okay if you, the only way it's okay for you to work on the Sabbath is if it's a job of necessity. Like you're a policeman, you're a doctor, you're a nurse, you're somewhere that has to work. But other than that, don't you work. It's almost like, where is that? I mean, that's something that was added by men is what that was. And they had added by men things too, okay? Now that's kind of not nearly as mean as their added by thing, because we would always say, let's help the guy. At least our added by man is, it's okay for them to work <laughs> on the Sabbath or something. But we talk about, we talk about people adding to the Bible, okay, and the Jewish people added to it to the point that it was no longer a time of peace. It was no longer a time of joy. It was no longer a family time. It was no longer a time for worship of God. It was a time that likely they feared. They thought, oh my gosh, it's another Sabbath come up today. It wasn't a day of joy when they had all these rules and bindings and things upon them like the Jews had come to do in those days. And after looking around at them all, he said to him, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Gives him a command. He obeys the command. He stretches the hand out, and boom, the hand's okay. Can you imagine how wonderful that would be? Yeah. I see people sometimes in a hospital where I work, and they I saw them a year ago, and then I see them again, and now they don't have feet anymore. 
or they don't have legs anymore. And it's like the diabetes and the bad things are taking away their body parts from them. Can you imagine how beautiful it would be if all of a sudden they got their foot back, they got their hand back, they got their arm back. Oh, what a beautiful thing this would be. And it had to be amazing, okay? And look at what it says. And after looking around at them all, think about this, Jesus staring at those Pharisees. And he said he already knew what they'd come for. He knew what they were thinking. They were trying to catch him off the sea of the on the Sabbath, and he looks right at him before he does it. Imagine that. I mean, this is bold. This is something that if you were in those days, it would be like the heart would be thumping. You'd be like, whoa, you see what's going on? He's now staring at the people that came here to catch him. He's not being sneaky about anything. He is boldly looking at them. Then he says, stretch out your hand as he looks at him. And the guy stretches out his hand and he heals him. So we see this boldness of Jesus. It's so beautiful. And, and look what we see happens. We see as he obeys, he is healed. Okay, And that's the same like they look at the paralyzed man in we preached a few Sundays ago, 5.23-24, he told them, stand up and walk. You know, Take your bed on out of here. Take, Lift that up and carry it on out of there. And he did. He obeyed. And how does this happen? It means they responded with faith. They don't respond with, I can't. I can't do that. Okay, And neither should we. When we are following the Lord and we know to do right and we know to obey Him, we feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit on our hearts drawing us, we should obey and say, yes, Lord, not I can't, I can't. This is not the way we see. We see faith is acted out with obedience, with movement, with action right here, okay? It's not that obedience and action and stuff that causes things to be, it's the faith that causes things to be. But we can see that the right response in faith is an act of obedience. And the, and the healing always happens with a response of faith. You know, Jesus tells them these things and they do it. But they themselves were filled with rage and were discussing together what they might do to Jesus. So that probably came from that look, you know. Imagine, he, he gave them that look and then he did it. And now these things have been going on. And I bet it was some of the same crew that was there from the Sabbath before when he said, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I get to make the rules. I'm the one that calls the shots. They were just already furious. And now they're catching him up for this. And now he stares at him and he does it. And we can see this rage. I mean, just think about this. The biggest thing with these days when I think of rage, I think of road rage, okay? And I hope you guys don't have road rage if you do. Please repent and ask God to show you mercy that you don't cause an accident or kill somebody get yourself killed, okay? But we know what road rage looks like. And think of these guys. They had rage, okay, when this was going on. And just, just think of it, okay? I told you, I think, a few weeks back, I'm going to say it again because some people didn't hear it, or maybe you were sleeping. I'm probably not the not really sleeping day. <laughs> but here... But I told you a while back, this is something that I felt horrible about, I repented of, was one day I was with my boy, and we were driving out from my house at the Drake and Hunt Road intersection, and somebody, it was my turn, and somebody else started to take that turn, and I pulled up, and we kind of crossed paths a little bit, looked at each other, and that guy, or the, the lady, gave me the special finger, right, and stared at me and saying some words, and I shook my fist back at him. And then my boy was all proud of me, and I thought, oh, what have I done? This is terrible that I showed this young man road rage, and, uh, you know, that, like, this is how you ought to be if somebody's bad to you. And I thought, I never should have done that. I had to repent, and I had to tell him that. I told him, you can ask him afterwards, maybe remember. But I told him afterwards, that's not what you do. I did the wrong thing. I never should have shook my fist at that guy. I shouldn't have done that. That was wrong. And that's... That's who we got to catch ourselves. But we do know we're sinners. We fall sometimes. There's trouble that go on. But the right thing to do is to repent and believe and go toward the Lord. We don't want to live in a place like that. I think the way the Bible paints these guys, they lived in a place like that. That's not a happy place to be at all. Not a good place for any of us. But here, it even, it's this almost like scripture fulfilled here too, okay? Psalm 37, 30 to 33, I, I paste it in here. Psalm 37, 30 says, The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom, and the tongue speaks justice. The law of his God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. The wicked spies upon the righteous and seeks to put him to death. That's what the Pharisees were doing to Jesus. Yahweh will not forsake him in his hand. 
he will not condemn him when he is judged. So we can totally apply this psalm right to Jesus' situation right here because it's exactly what was going on. And uh, these guys were, were looking out to cause Jesus trouble, but it says Yahweh won't forsake him in his hand. He won't condemn him when he is judged because they were trying to judge Jesus. Now I have a few of these slides, and don't don't fall asleep on me. Don't lose it. They're good. They're good. Okay. And they're my closing slides. All right. Do you have peace that that God has got? I I really do. I like that theology. Some maybe some people could take it to the wrong way to some extreme, but I really do. I live my life. God's got this. God's got it. No matter what goes on in this life, I'm going to be okay because God has it. That's a way of peace. Think about all the troubles, the struggles, the things you're going through. If you can go and pray to the Lord, and you ask Him, you plead with Him, you, you bring these troubles to Him, but at the end of it, you say, I know God's got this. He is God. I'm going to be okay because God sits on the throne. God is in control of everything. God's got it. All right? And that's my question. Do you have this kind of peace that God has? It? Sabbath consciousness is grounded in the fundamental conviction that God is willing and able to, to provide enough for humans to survive and thrive. You know, if you took a day down from week work back then, in those days, that wouldn't be, you know, when you're as poor as poor could be, you know, when you're barely able to eat. That's trusting God that God's going to provide and give you the food, the sustenance that you need. It is based on the belief that life and well-being ultimately are gifts from God, not products of human effort. Though these gifts are channeled through human labor, Sabbath consciousness thus is grounded in humility, recognizing and respecting the limits of being human. In a nutshell, Sabbath consciousness is grateful confidence in the abundant life given by God, and humble self-restraint is the appropriate response to the God who unselfishly sustains all creation. That's the right way for us to be, is to be humble before God, thankful, and look at this as a gift that God gives us a time to rest, to be at peace, to know that God has this, okay? Another question to you. Do you choose the gospel of grace or one of works righteousness? I tell you those Pharisees were works righteousness through and through. It's all about their actions, what they do, and that's whether they're going to get to heaven or not by their works. There's still people a lot like that around today, and I hope it's not you guys. Jesus places greater emphasis on the ethical, spiritual aspect of religion rather than on that of the ceremonial. Emphasis on the ceremonial leads invariable to formalism. Cold smugness and indifference to the welfare of others. That's that guy beating on that pulpit all angry. Could care less about anybody really. Just wants to make his point come across. Emphasis on the ethical spiritual lead leads to growth in grace and in love for God and others. The bitter Pharisees in this incident reveal the tendency of some religious persons towards strict conformity to outer forms. Proper religious rites, proper religious attire, and proper religious behavior to the neglect of mercy and compassion. Mercy and compassion are so important for us. This tendency imports as mercenary spirit into religion. Okay, mercenary, think of that crazy guy from Wagner Group. A fondness for negatives and a jaundiced view toward others. The Pharisees implying to destroy Jesus illustrate Pascal's ad adage, men never do evil so completely and cheerfully as when they do it from the religious conviction. Think about that. That's a good quote from this guy, Pascal. He was the guy that said, like, the God-shaped hole in your heart that we got, and that's why we need God and things. And he said some other good things, too. But he he said that the worst evil comes from those who do it out of religious conviction. You know, think about how many things in history if somebody said they did it because they did it out of religious conviction. You can read some very evil things that have gone on in history when people try to use God as their excuse. Consciousness of the goodness of God in giving the Sabbath should counter this mean-spirited outlook. Jesus' understanding of how the Sabbath observance is to be lived out reveals God's ultimate love for humans. And those who know God manifest love of their fellow humans. 1 John 4, 7, 8 basically says, if you don't have love, you don't have God. But if you got love, that's a beautiful thing. Because God is love, the Bible says, and we see some beautiful things all about love. So if you have somebody that's just purely mean and hateful and strict, oh my, don't 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 feed off of them. <laughs> don't let that become you, okay? You know, let the word enrich you, let it fill you. You know, it's it's beautiful. And there's tons of 
joy, okay? Joy is definitely something that's a byproduct of being a believer. No matter what your situation is, when you truly start to look at things in the biblical manner, you can still have joy at the end of it because you know God's got it and there's joy to be had. There's no joy with some of these mean folks. One more slide before my last slide, okay? I promise. And my thing to you, it says, I want to tell you, don't be legalistic, man-focused meanness, okay? Think about this. People who are realistic, legalistic, what are they? They're works-based, they're man-focused, and they're mean, and they're strict, and they're hard to be around, okay? You want to run away from you. Be you we should we be, we should be Christ-focused and have an attitude of love and kindness. I tell you, in my daily Bibles, I've been in the Psalms, you guys are following me in the Psalms, it is amazing how much that word loving kindness is used over and over and over again. It's something you should thank God for, His loving kindness. You should be appreciative of it. It'll make you want to worship Him more, okay? But if you're all legalistic and mean, you don't see words like that. You don't think of words like that. That's just the fluff. You don't want to see it, but it's all over. It's beautiful. Contemporary application of this section can be difficult. Because overtly strict Sabbath observances is hardly a problem among God's people today. We really don't have this too often today with most people. But it helps if we can get to the heart of the matter. And J.C. Ryle, he nailed it when he observed what excessive importance hypocrites attach to trifles. And isn't this true? Think about it with people. I get this all the time as a Christian, right? They say, well, if you're a Christian, then you wouldn't want to shoot a gun. And if you're a Christian, then you wouldn't want to... Uh, to be angry at somebody. If you're a Christian, why wouldn't you just totally forgive and forget whatever somebody's ever done to you? I mean, think about this. With the people that aren't Christians, they give some harsh stuff to us, don't they? And, and, and I like what J.C. Ryle said. He said, with excessive importance, the hypocrites attach to the trifles. They put so much stuff on the little stuff to try to push you down and hold us down. Let that stuff roll off your back like water off a duck's back. When we look at it like that, we realize we have our own way of being in bondage to trivia that we've given almost biblical status. In some circles in my country, this guy's from America, any faithful Christian parents will, it is implied, certainly place their child in overtly Christian schools or else carry on homeschooling. So I've, I've been around some folks. I do do this. We do this. But we don't say everybody's got to do this, so some people will. Certainly not in state-supported public schools. Or there may be others who decry dating of Christian young people. They think there should be no dating at all. We say there was a book a little while ago that some preacher wrote about how you should never date. And then the guy lost his faith and said he's an atheist. Oh, so all these people who were super strict, they're like, yeah, you see this book? This guy's got it right. No dating at all. And now he says he doesn't even believe in God. And I thought, oh, what's the irony in that? We see, like I told you, the guy that beat the pope and was all crazy. Even though I had strict good doctrine to... I thought, what's that? Next thing you know, he was in, he was in prison, all right? And uh, it says, there are some clergy types who tout their freedom and love for alcohol and cigars, but insist there can be no celebration of Christmas or Easter in the churches they serve. I've seen people like this. They're like, they're drinkers. I myself am not a drinker at all, but I don't say nobody can be a drinker. Can't be drunk. That's what the Bible says for sure. But, but I've, seen, I've seen that folks that are like, brag about, you know, making all their alcohol and their liquor and their brews, and yet they're like, oh, I'm not following Christmas or Easter. Those are pagan holidays. Don't get that Christmas tree out of here. And they're thinking, what are you doing with all this killing yourself and all this smoking? And, 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 and most of the time, this doesn't happen all the time. Well, it doesn't frazzle you if you're a person that takes a drink sometimes. But most of the time what I've seen, people who say they have their Christian liberty to drink, a lot of them are alcoholics. They drink to excess. They drink to feel good. Their judgment is definitely slurred. And if they were honest with themselves, those are the times when they need to repent and say, God, what did I say? What did I do? How did I go in that way? But yet, at the same time, some of these folks will be so crazy. And I'll give you one more example about this angry preacher, this Pharisee thing. Is there was a guy, I don't want to say his name, because if I get in trouble, maybe, or he might find out, but he <laughs> pastored a church around here, and I know some of you guys know this guy. And it was a really strict church, and it was a church that said, like, you can only use the King James Bible. It was really strict. And and I asked him, this guy was as liberal in the liberal gutter as you could get, because I met him on a different plane doing chaplaincy. And I thought, how did this guy pastor that church? 
when this guy is so left field. I don't even know if he's a Christian, he was so left field. And you know what he told me? He said, Buck, when they came in to question me, I just beat that desk and said, how dare you question the pastor? I am the pastor here. And he says, that's what they wanted. That was the kind of church they had with this legalistic, tough type of meanness. And when he returned it back to them, they thought, oh, he's one of us. He's good. He's good. <laughs> even though he never was. Even though he was just super liberal the whole time. I mean, this was really something that I saw and I thought, golly, that's not good at all right there, okay? It's crazy. I won't do that to you. If I do that to you, I better repent. That's a heck of a thing. If I start yelling at you, shouting, oh, I am the bastard. What a bunch of prideful baloney is that, okay? That's bad news. All right, so here is immaturity is what it is. So, so here, that was, a, that was a good thing. I want to point this out. Don't be legalistic in that focus. And my last slide, this is one to bring you up in case I brought you down at all. I hope I didn't bring you down today. But this is what Jesus said. And if you want, I have books like this that I can give you for free. If I haven't given you one before, by a guy named uh, Dane Ortland wrote this book called Gentle and Lowly. Uh, Mike read it twice. He liked it so much in under a month right there. I mean, so it is, it's a good book to show you how much God loves you. And a man's from a Puritan perspective, too. It's beautiful. But it says, Jesus said this in Matthew 11, 28 to 30 to describe his character to us. He said, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. That's Jesus' character. Gentle and humble in heart. Isn't that beautiful? And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's beautiful. And we need that. We all desperately need this. We can't bear the burden of our own sin. We can't bear the burden of all these troubles. We need Jesus Christ. We need forgiveness. We need His love. We need His compassion. We need His mercy. And I wrote at the top here, will you come to Jesus today? Will you repent and believe the gospel? That's the recipe for all things in life. Repent and believe the gospel. You get messed up, you're not sure, you're worried, troubles have come upon you, repent and believe the gospel. Will you find freedom from the burden of your sin and the harshness of a legalistic, works-based salvation? I know some folks I've run into in life, no one is sitting here, but I know some folks that get so caught up with a legalistic, works-based salvation with church stuff that they get lied to and they think they got to do all this stuff and that's what depends is whether they're going to go to heaven or not. The only thing that depends whether you're going to go to heaven or not is whether you have faith in Jesus Christ alone. If you have faith in Him, if you're born again, you are going to heaven. Not because of anything you did, but because of what He did on that cross. And it says, I wrote here, can you call the Sabbath a delight? If you read Isaiah 58, which is getting toward the end times in the book of Isaiah, what does it call when you read those verses? It calls the Sabbath a delight. A delight. Could you imagine the Jews reading Isaiah 58? They might thought, I don't know who can get a delight out of this with all those rules that the, the, the leaders had put on them and all the crushing stuff. But that's what it calls a Sabbath a delight. God's grace has penetrated Paul's heart. Think about this. You know, Paul was one of those guys who was a Pharisee too. A Pharisee of Pharisees, he said. And it penetrated his heart. Will it penetrate your heart? grace of God. And that's where I leave you today and I'm going to do communion. So if you guys will, uh, my, uh, Ricky, come, Mike, come and you guys uh, take the communion here and pass it out. The way we do communion here is it's uh, you should only take communion if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You should only take communion if you're good with Him in the sense that you've repented of your sins, that you've forgiven the people that you're bitter against. And that you are in a good standing with Him. That's how we should take communion. The Bible says that people that didn't take communion in the right fashion, God was making some of them sick and killing them, is what it says in Corinthians 11. So as we take communion, it is something that's special. It's something that holy we do toward God. And it's something we do in a way that we honor God and we don't do it flippantly. And so take a few moments as well, too, to pray to God and to find your peace with God. And... Uh, before we take this communion. And we'll take it all together. Some people have been here before, and so how we do it. I'll, I'll leave.
Go ahead and take, there's a cellophane piece on top of the top that's like see-through. Peel that back and you get to the bread. And uh, I say it all the time, if it doesn't get old to me, I hope it doesn't get old to you hearing me say it or thinking about it. But you think about Isaiah 53 where it says, it pleased the Father to crush the Son. And think about your own kids, think about your own loved ones, think about how you would never want to crush them never want to kill him. You'd only want to do good by him through and through. And yet it says it pleased God to crush his own son, you and I. And that was Jesus. And Jesus was holy. Jesus was God. Jesus had never done anything wrong. And if you think about the love of God, our love is just a little bit of a smidgen of the image of God that was put upon us in creation. It's nothing as deep as what God's love was. It's so much more deeper, so much more greater. And I would never let anything happen to my little fellow. But Think about God. God crushed His only begotten Son for you and I. And that's how much He loved us. And that's what salvation's about. It's not about some little bit of little rules here, a bit of little rules there, or how strict or legalistic or mean you are. It's about what Jesus Christ did on that cross. It's about what God the Father did. He gave His Son for you and I. And Jesus willingly went to that cross. And it wasn't through some easy, joyful time. It was in a time of the greatest suffering has probably ever happened because every sin of every one of us and every other person that's ever been in heaven or will be in heaven was laid upon him and he felt the shame and he felt the wrath of God as he suffered for you and I. So when we break this bread, it's of a great deal that we think about what Jesus Christ did for us as we take it. When we take the grape juice here, don't worry. Not causing anybody any alcoholic issues in this church. And we've got grape juice, and it represents the blood of Jesus Christ. Just like the wine represented the blood of Jesus Christ back in those days, okay? And, and as we get ready to take this, we think about it. The cross is brutal. A guy I work with, an Orthodox priest that I like a lot, he's so mad at this little children's Bible that we hand out to the new moms because it misses the page about the cross. It goes straight from from uh, it goes straight from the Psalm Sunday to the tomb. And he's like, the cross is the most important thing of all right there. And I, I can agree with him with that. It, whenever he sees me moving those Bibles and getting them set up, he says, he says, oh, you got those Bibles that leave the cross out, Buck. And I say, I know, I know. But I'm glad it has other things in it, but that is, that's the epitome of our faith, is the cross, and it's brutal, and it's ugly, and our sins are brutal, and they're ugly, and it demanded that God himself would shed his blood for you and I, that we could be saved, that that's how bad of the sinners we were, and that's what Christ did to save us from our sins. So when we drink this cup, it represents the blood of Christ, and it represents how he washed our sins away with that blood, and we drink it and proclaim them until the day that he returns. And now, if you're new here, you're like, oh my gosh, this guy just keeps going. I really can't, I am a Baptist. But, but, for a short, short version right here, short time, I'm almost at the end of my prayer book. I'm on the last two pages of my prayer book. 